Hello, and welcome to Fiction Fans, a podcast where we read books and other words, too. I'm Lily. And I'm Sarah. And today, we will be discussing The Foundling, The Heist, and The Volcano by K.R.R. Lockhaven. But first, Sarah, what's something great that happened recently? Something great that happened recently is my father bought a new couch. Or rather, he bought the couch a while ago, but it was delivered. And this is exciting because he has had the same futon in his house for the last at least 20 years, possibly closer to 25. And so it's nice to see his living room take steps towards being a living room that looks like an adult lives there and not a college student. (laughs) I love you, Dad. (laughs) Good for Uncle Frank. (laughs) Yeah, it's a really nice couch, too. And his living room still needs a lot of work, but... It's a nice couch and it looks good in the living room. Now, which one of you picked it out? Me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he he approved of it. He wouldn't course, buy it if he yeah. didn't like it. But yeah, yeah it's, I think probably if he had his druthers, he would still have the futon. Well, no, that's being a little unfair because he was the one who wanted to get a new couch in the first place. But my father is a wonderful person but he moves at a glacially slow pace when it comes to change Mm -hmm. and furniture change. Well, it's good he has you around to melt those glaciers a little, huh? (laughs) Yep. Global warming when it comes to uh, furniture buying, that's me. (laughs) It's a very strange analogy, and I'm sorry I started it. (laughs) (laughs) All your fault. What's your good thing? Oh, I haven't had to do any overtime this week been glorious that is indeed a very good thing it really is last week was my first like fully present week back at work since the holidays and also some sick semi time off and turns out people needed stuff from me (laughs) and they needed it right now did that still got lots of shit to do but i can do it during reasonable hours and not eight o'clock at night good You should not be working at eight o'clock at night when you're still recuperating from the plague. Man, no one should be working that long. By the time, honestly, by 4.30, my brain is just mush. Yes. It takes me twice as long to do anything and it's riddled with errors. Yeah, I mean, that's true too. Like people should not be working at eight o'clock because that's just not a reasonable hour. Or, I mean, you can work at eight if that is your preferred hour of work but you have not been working since eight in the morning uh yes i specifically phrased it as that long (laughs) yes (laughs) for exactly that reason anyway enough complaining it's fine that doesn't happen like ever this is maybe the second time in two years i've had to work late so i can suck it up (laughs) well i'm glad you didn't have to work late this week yes me too and what are we drinking tonight I am drinking a kind of mediocre red wine from a box. It's not that great, but it's red wine that I own and have. And so I'm going to drink it and I'm not going to complain because, yeah. Now, I feel like wine from a box would have to be pretty damn unfortunate for me to call it mediocre because my bar is already very low for box wine. Or are you judging it on regular wine standards? (laughs) Maybe I'm drinking it a little on regular wine standards, but you also drink uh, really bad box wine. Yes, I am aware of this. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, yeah, it's box wine. That's fine. Yeah, but there, like, there is box wine that is maybe not quite as good as like regular bottled wine, but not that bad. Yeah. And normally this brand is not that bad, and I'm just really not enjoying this red wine. Absolutely. Obviously, not all box wine is created equal. I'm just saying my evaluation of it is different from wine that comes in a bottle that does not have a version that's 1.5 liters. <laughs> okay, I guess what I should say is I'm comparing this, I'm calling it mediocre as compared to the other box wine that I have had that is this brand of box wine, which I enjoy better. Fair enough. <laughs> I am again enjoying some green tea with turmeric. And I was correct. Once I knew what to expect, it is just fine. Oh, good. Yeah, I think the first time I tasted it, I was just, you know, not exactly paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> I was a little taken aback, but it's fine. 
Well, when you know what you're getting into, it's a lot easier to enjoy something. That's true. And I have not read anything recently. (laughs) How about you, Sarah? I've read a lot of fan fiction. I've read a certain amount of video game dialogue. I've read the next book for our next podcast recording. I have not read anything like any books, any published books that are in book format on my own. Excellent. (laughs) It's not often that we're on the same standard. (laughs) <laughs> on the same level. <laughs> uh, I haven't even been reading fan fiction. That is how little time I have had. Oh, jeez. I did get into a Sherlock, like the BBC TV series Sherlock fan fiction swing a couple weeks ago, but I burnt out on that pretty quickly. Mm. One of the fan fiction stories that I read was a crossover between the book Hench by Natalie Somebody or Other, which I have not read, but really want to. And the website Ask a Manager, which even though I'm not job searching or anything, I do read religiously because it's great. And that fan fiction was a lot of fun. (laughs) I've heard about that. I think the blog writer actually posted about it. Yeah, I think that's how I heard about it was Allison had posted. Allison being the owner of Ask a Manager and the manager that you are asking questions of. Well, that sounds delightfully silly. And what a fun idea. (laughs) Yeah, it was really good. And you don't have to have any knowledge of Hench to enjoy the the story. It's just a one shot. Or Ask a Manager, I imagine. (laughs) (laughs) Everything you need to know about Ask a Manager is there in the name. And it's just a one shot. So it's not like it's a big time commitment or anything. It's like 1700 words. Oh, damn. That's very short. Okay. it, It might be a little longer than that, but it's, I think, three letters It's formatted like a blog post, an Ask a Manager blog post, where it's three letters writing into Allison about advice, working with the supervillains and heroes. Well, that sounds very fun, and I can't wait to read it. I know you sent me a link to it. I did send you a link. You should- I haven't gotten there yet. (laughs) You should read it. (laughs) Also, that was a very excellent pug noise that there's no way I can cut out because it was right while you were speaking. So everyone just gets to enjoy that. Which is really unfortunate, because that was indeed a pug toot. Uh, You know, we do mark these episodes explicit. You can say the word fart. Yes, it was that too. (laughs) It was a fart and a toot. (laughs) All right. And on that note, let's talk about the foundling, the heist, and the volcano. Actually, that's a very good segue, because there's a whole song in this book about a princess who farts. Exactly. Is that princess Mr. Squeak? I think it might be. Possible. Jury's out, but I'm voting yes. (laughs) Well, listeners, this might surprise you, but in this book, there is indeed a foundling, a heist, and a volcano. You do get what it says on the tin. (laughs) I'm being a little silly. So before we get any further, this book is the sequel to The Marauders, The Daughter, and The Dragon by K.R. and Lockhaven, which we covered back in August, I want to say, of last year. And this book covers more of Azur's adventures. She's now the captain of the ship. And there's... A foundling. (laughs) A heist. No, I I had to stop because... And a volcano? Someone else made it and another noise. Uh. <laughs> Someone is really jealous. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> no, <at least> are <laughs> you are you gonna be able to do the podcast tonight? You're gonna have to fumigate your house. <laughs> it's not it's not smelly. These ones. I mean pug farts can be pretty pretty bad. These are just noisy. And distracting. (laughs) All right. We'll see how much of this we can get through before we burst into laughter again. (laughs) Anyway, yes, there there is a foundling, a heist, and volcano. And they have to deal with all of these things in different ways. We actually had the delight of being able to read this book in an earlier version. And seeing how it has changed and grown throughout the process has been very, very fun. And we did this with The Marauders, The Daughter, and The Dragon, too. But it's really neat to see 
what changes and what stays the same and how the story is strengthened in this final version as compared to the the first version that we read? Well, there is one thing. You know a book is good when it forces you to self-reflect and makes you aware of, of yourself and your own strengths and weaknesses. And there was this one moment during the heist. I'm not going to give any spoilers for the heist itself. There is a heist, I think, at this point. We're all aware of this. Wait, but that's such a big spoiler. (laughs) Uh, Well, then for absolutely no reason at all, Azur has to climb something. This is not something that is meant to be climbed. It's a little bit of a struggle. And she is using her arms to lift herself up and over this wall. I guess just up this wall. And, you know, it really just reinforced the fact that I gotta be able to do a pull-up. Better you than me. (laughs) But Sarah, what if I'm in a life-or-death situation where my motorcycle has driven off the side of a cliff and exploded, and I'm holding onto the cliff by my fingertips, and I have to get back up onto the ground? I'm just gonna die in a blaze of glory. I gotta be able to do one, just one (laughs) pull-up. That is my fitness goal for this year. (laughs) Do one pull up. <laughs> and that will that will save you if you're hanging by your fingertips off a cliff, this one pull up. Well, that's all you need. Once you've done one pull up, you're up the cliff. If I'm farther down the cliff than the top, yeah, I'm just letting you go. <laughs> well, I, I didn't have quite that amount of self-reflection when I read this book, but I support you in your goal of doing a pull up. Thank you. In all seriousness, though, there are some very thoughtful moments in this book. I think that was one of the really huge strengths of MD&D, The Marauders, The Daughter, and The Dragon, the first book of the Azur Archipelago. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Especially surrounding the relationship between Azur and her father. And in this book, the focus has shifted, I mean, quite a bit. Her father's not in this book nearly as much as the first one. But we do still get some very intimate interpersonal relationships both romantic and not there are some really beautiful friendships in this book yeah i think pile is really good at writing relationships and writing interpersonal like not conflict but because it's it's not conflict but having that be one of the focal points of his novels i'm sure i said the same thing about the first book but This book is so much fun and so very silly. There is an entire song about a princess who farts. (laughs) Mr. Squeak. Yes. (laughs) He wrote an entire song about Mr. Squeak, who is a princess that likes to fart. I mean, technically, her kennel name, because she's purebred, which is why she has lots of problems. But her kennel name is Kirby's Cottage Princess. So it's there. There you go. And that's all great and very enjoyable. But it is that thoughtful exploration of the nature of human interaction as kind of a really douchey way of putting it. Well, that's that's the counterpoint that all of the fun shenanigans kind of need in order to make it a book that actually has depth. Exactly. And it, this really strikes a nice balance. I would actually say that this book is even more delightful than the first book. Hear me out. I think the first book is perhaps higher literature literature, for the fact that it deals with some pretty heavy issues between Azor and her father that are very complex and never really, there's no yes or no answer to what's going on. You just kind of have to deal with that middle ground and that's pretty complex. Whereas the nature of the relationships explored in this book, while thoughtful, are not as harrowing to read about now i don't know how to pronounce harrow sarah harrowing? it's harrow harrow harrowing <laughs> you just you just pronounced harrow the ninth incorrectly it is harrowing okay it's not harrow i can't say that word anymore it's not a word to read about there we go that was the end of that sentence i made it <laughs> you know you're you're exploring these were being needlessly vague at the beginning of the book it's introduced that azur and elijah one of the main characters from the first book have gotten engaged and so we're seeing we're not necessarily seeing the relationship develop but we are seeing them come to terms with the way their relationship has developed and so while there is you know that exploration and discussion it's ultimately very sweet (laughs) 
<laughs> and it doesn't have that edge of like, I don't know, I don't know the answer <laughs> that the first book gave you. I would say that the first book definitely focuses on interpersonal conflict in a way that this one doesn't, because there is no conflict between Azur and Elijah, which makes for a really nice change of pace, to be honest. Not, I'm not specifically directing that against Demrod or the Daughter of the Dragon, but in a lot of books where there's a romance involved, I feel like there's often some kind of conflict that the relationship has to overcome. And it's nice that there's not that kind of issue between these two. There are so many really solid relationships, romantic relationships specifically. There's the married orc couple, Nargol and Orok, who are just the absolute best. And honestly, I gotta say, one of my main comments about this book as a whole (laughs) was how it absolutely fucking nails wholesome horniness. (laughs) (laughs) There's there's a lot of horniness in this book, but yes, it is quite wholesome on the whole. <laughs> there is so much just like couples really appreciating each other. You know, the the established couples, of course. But then there's also just sort of general horniness. <laughs> uh, one of the main characters, Brisa, is a Siguapa, which is a non-human race in this book. Is that are Siguapas a real thing? I don't think so. I was going to Google it before the episode started, and then you distracted me with tiddly dragons. <laughs> I distracted you with tiddly dragons. So I think you distracted yourself with tiddly dragons. Oh, they're from Dominican folklore. Oh. Very cool. Well, then I, I'm i mistaken. They are a real thing. Anyway, every single character thinks she's the hottest thing in the world. Azur agrees she's the hottest thing in the world. <laughs> Just every single person is like, yeah, Reese's hot as hell and that's fine it's just yeah she's just really hot and everyone likes it and it doesn't get gross until someone makes it weird one of her friends of course because they're her friends they wouldn't make it weird obviously not yeah because they're good friends (laughs) and so just again having that balance of wholesome horniness and not just restricted to you know monogamous long-term committed relationships just like yeah it's, it's nice to look at hot people sometimes and that's fine don't gotta make it weird. Robin also is someone who engages in a lot of wholesome horniness because Robin is quite horny all of the time. Robin is uh, Azur's Robin sidekick. <laughs> Shit talking bird sidekick. And she's wonderful. But she makes no bones about the fact that she wants to bang other birds. You know, if she sees a, a hot bird, she's gonna go after him. And what's really lovely is that even though she has a lot of relationships, there's no kind of like love triangle, specifically in this book where she has the relationship that was kind of established in the first book in that she and I forget the bird's name. Nova. Nova, yeah. Like they go off and they have babies and then she meets someone else in this book, Sir Terry. And when Nova and Sir Terry meet, there's almost going to be like a showdown, but then there's not because, you know, they're all mature adult birds (laughs) i feel like that sentence got away from me just a little bit no that's the kind of like beautiful nonsense that comes out of this book (laughs) i thought you were gonna say that comes out of this podcast but yes that is that is the kind of beautiful nonsense that comes out of this book but it's nice because like you just want to read about people having fun in their relationships And sometimes you don't want a big conflict over, like, yeah, I'm breaking up with you because I'm going to go out with this bird now. Yeah, it's just uh, people handling themselves very well. And birds. People and birds alike. (laughs) Characters. Yes. It was nice. Yeah, this book, I would say, more approaches cozy fantasy. There is still danger. You know, there's a heist. And a volcano. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) the emotions you feel reading this book like even following through the journeys and the ups and downs and the highs and lows you always feel good yeah and I think one of the things that helps make it a little cozier than the first book is the fact that that interpersonal conflict is not one of the main sources of conflict because that for me that was one of the things that really made it not cozy I mean also yes there's a bit of gore in the first book and I feel like you get less of that in this one too there was a moment 
is that a spoiler but it's a robin in a fight and something about it being birds made it a little bit less immediate i don't know i mean i agree with you that maybe the two combatants being birds made it a little less immediate but i also think that just there's less descriptions of like gruesome wounds that's true yeah that's the only example in this book i can think of and i think there's a couple in the first one yeah there's more fighting this one has more espionage (laughs) this one this one has more heist the last one has more battle uh you know what this book also has more of tiddly dragons or marauders oh both (laughs) (laughs) the tiddly dragons are these very cute little guys who use puffs of air to disorient bees and they eat bees and i shouldn't love them because don't eat bees we need those (laughs) but they're so cute you can also feed them bacon and they'll like you yes uh and you know who does that blunderbuss a marauder we get to see much more of in this book (laughs) i really loved like getting a little glimpse into the secret life of blunderbuss who i would say is still a secondary character but in the first book it kind of felt like he was just a name in a list of names in the marauder crew whereas we got to see him do a lot more here yeah you definitely get more of a sense of his personality in this book and like you say he drives the action a lot more and his mysterious past yeah i wanted to learn more about his mysterious past but i'm happy just watching him befriend a flock of tiddly dragons (laughs) (laughs) Among the very cute things that we get in this book, there also is, of course, more capybaras. I'm a little mystified by the capybaras. I don't know if I said that last time. I love it. It's great. It's delightful. It's a little random, but that's great. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's just an aspect of this world, I guess. Yeah, capybaras are just very relevant to life in this universe. And Lockhaven cements that in very fun ways. Not only are there capybaras often roaming around in the wild, and we, of course, have our power couple, Alistair and Eleanor. Oh, no. Covington. Thank you. Alistair and Eleanor Covington, who are the ship's capybaras and have a very romantic love scene. (laughs) 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 But there's also, I'm going to read this excellent quote just because I think it showcases very well how integrated capybaras are. Risa ran up, hands out in front of her like she was holding an invisible capybara. It's my favorite simile ever. (laughs) It's a nice way to integrate the importance of capybaras into the text. Using them as a reference point, I think, really showcases how important they are, right? Mm -hmm. That's just what you think of. Yeah, how how big of a thing they are in society. Mm -hmm. Instead of just like a bunch of exposition saying... No, guys, really. Capybaras are very important. (laughs) Stuff like this is just excellent flavor, and I loved it. Yes. Well, Sarah, before we get into our spoilers section, why should somebody read this book? Well, first off, if you've read and enjoyed The Marauders, The Daughter, and The Dragon, you should read this book. If you want some great relationships, wholesome horniness, as we've talked about at length, if you want some excellent heists, Also more dragon, although that doesn't come up in the title. We haven't talked about the foundling much, but there is Oriana, a young girl who is found (laughs) by the Marauders early on and joins the team for a little bit. And Kyle, you're very clearly a dad because you're very good at writing characters taking care of an (laughs) (laughs) eight-year-old. It felt very sincere. (laughs) So that's also a great reason. It's hard to find child characters done well we've talked about this before at great length with crystal matar they're not lampshades they're tiny people yeah but oriana definitely feels like a person absolutely so that's another great reason since this is a sequel uh i think it should be asked do you have to read the first book first i would say you definitely should there's a lot of relationships that are being continued from that book and i don't think you would get the full impact if you didn't see where they started yeah i mean i think you would understand the plot if you didn't but you definitely would be lost 
in the relationship development and why it matters and why it's great if you don't have the context of the first book. I also feel like the world building picks up from the first book. Yeah. In a way that's very good if you've read both, but I think would be confusing if you had not. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't I don't think that this should be considered a standalone novel. All right. I mean, that's fair. It is a sequel, but yeah. <laughs> I figured since we're talking about it and why you should read it, I thought that would be maybe a relevant uh, conversation. Yeah, I mean, I mean, technically you can, but just because you can doesn't mean you should. If it sounds interesting, go read the first one. It's also very good. Yeah. Now, before we actually move on to our spoiler section, I think you had a quote that you wanted to share with the class. Yes. And it's an excellent quote, to be fair. Family, she looked at Azure. Friends, she spread her wings, indicating the marauders around her. And she paused, head tilted. Fun. Those are the only three Fs I have to give. I love Robin. Robin is the best. <laughs> yep. Oh, she did win our um, best supporting character. Or one of the best supporting characters <laughs> from our 2022 year in review. And she does not disappoint. Will she win that in 2023 again? Quite possibly. <laughs> To avoid spoilers, skip to 4740. We had some new villains in this book and some returning villains. Yeah. We got to see Captain Roberts again. Is that his name? Oh, no. Y yes, I believe, okay. I believe so. And, and he has a little more... I don't want to say he has a little more depth to him, but we see a different side of him almost... In the sense that when he and Azur battle it out, like he kind of seems regretful that he has to be fighting her. It definitely seems like it's an ego thing. Like yeah. he doesn't hate Azur, but she defeated him and he can't let that happen. It, I, so for me, I felt it was less an ego thing in the sense that like he can't let it happen because his ego won't let it happen. And more reputation. Yeah, reputation. Like he can't let it happen because... If he does, what will his crew think of him? Like, they'll mutiny again. Yeah, you're right. That's a better way of putting it. Yeah. And not just his crew, but also just people. People aren't afraid of him anymore because he's not mm -hmm. undefeated. Mm -hmm. And so that was very, like, interesting to have that not reluctant villain, but... Just, just a smidge of that. Yeah, and I would be really interested to see if that gets explored any further in the next book. Because I'm assuming that he's not out for the count. I mean, like... He escapes from jail at the end. Yeah, like, I'm assuming he'll be back, so... <laughs> I guess, yeah, like, I wouldn't even call him a villain. He's an antagonist. Yeah. But then, of course, you gotta have some bigots, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> and that place is held by the casino owner? Yes. I don't remember his name. That's fine. <laughs> I don't... I don't remember his name either. Mr. Casino. Yes, that one. <laughs> who's extremely racist against fawns in particular, but also all non-humans. Yeah, I mean, he he was a big supporter of Governor Pratt. You may or may not recall from the first book that Governor Pratt was the main villain who thought humans first. He had this humans first mentality where, you know, because of fawns and saguapa and orcs, humans were being downtrodden and deserve to rise up and take their place of superiority over everyone else. He thought that humans shouldn't have to share. Yep. That's a much more concise way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> and so we sort of get that energy again from Mr. Casino. <laughs> I would look up his name <laughs> if I didn't hate him so much. Yeah. And this is not a delightful hate. Like, he just sucks. Yeah, I mean, he's supposed to. Right. So, like, Lockhaven does a great job, but we still hate him. It's true. And honestly, that makes... <laughs> I mean, Azur is stealing from him. Now, he stole the stuff first. That's true. But it's... She's not 
stealing she's reclaiming there you go but also he sucks so you're like yeah take all his shit i don't care i mean she doesn't even take all his shit she just takes the stuff that didn't belong to him well some of the stuff i bet there was more but that was my internal monologue during the heist (laughs) it makes it very easy to root for her yes it does make it easy to, to root for her i don't know if i think that she takes stuff that doesn't belong to her though no, I know. That's what I was saying. Yeah, take all his stuff. <laughs> That's not what she does. Oh, okay. Okay, I misunderstood <laughs> what you had said. Yeah. yeah. No, that is what I said. I was just being confusing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I would have taken stuff of his that I was not hired to take back. Yeah, that guy sucks. <laughs> yeah, he sucks. He was horrible. But on the other hand, his conjured falcon, Farron, who is still a villain. I mean, like, don't get me wrong. But she was a lot of fun to root against in a way that Mr. Casino was not. I mean, I was definitely rooting against Mr. Casino vehemently, but that was more of a, like, grudge? He just sucked. Whereas Farron is so much fun. He wasn't, yeah, Mr. Casino is not fun to root against. You're just like, yeah, take this guy out. He needs it. Desperately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas Farron is, like, villainous in the best kind of way. She immediately sees through their plan, but she's a sidekick, so no one listens to her. (laughs) (laughs) Poor Farron. (laughs) And so, yeah, maybe that's also, like, you're a little sympathetic, because it's like, damn, if her boss listened to her for a second, he would be better off. But, of course, it's good that he doesn't, because he, fuck him. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And that's part of why he sucks, is because he's so mean to his employees. He sucks for a lot of reasons. I mean, he's just a mean person in general. Yeah. And Farron isn't nice, but... Farron is at least honest about it. Yes. And she's not wrong. It's her job to protect the casino, and there are people heisting the casino. Yeah. So, like, yeah, okay, it's her job to stop them. (laughs) Yeah. Is heisting a word? I don't think so. Well, that's what they were doing. They were heisting, yes. We talked a little bit about the first book and how a lot of that, the emotional core of that book really centers around Azur's relationship with her father and dealing with his support of Governor Pratt. But in this book, we really see her reflecting on not her current relationship with her father, but her childhood and sort of seeing her parents in a different light in hindsight and i don't know i think everyone has a moment where they look back and go oh (laughs) yeah i i really liked the introspection that azura does and this is partially because she's now caretaker of oriana this foundling that they have found and so she's you know taking care of her and and singing these lullabies that her parents sang to her and she's like oh this song is actually kind of like fear-mongering and and this story that this bedtime story that they told has a horrible ending where the jaguar eats this old woman who tries to do him a good turn and like i didn't realize how kind of messed up this was until i'm reflecting on it as an adult with my own quote unquote child and it was just really interesting to see how that kind of culture of fear could have impacted her mother well her parents and and their decision to follow governor pratt like you understand why kind of they were drawn to him because they have this mentality that you know the unknown is scary I also really loved just finding out more about her mother in general. Mm -hmm. We know that she has passed away before any of the story has begun, but we don't hear much about her in the first book, except that Azur and her father miss her, obviously. And so then in this book, learning more about her through the eyes of Azur, who is experiencing motherhood for the first time, is just such a sweet and dynamic way of going about it sweet and also a little sad because of aforementioned cultures of fear yeah like all you know about her really in the first book was that she was a good woman but then she kind of turned racist and started following governor pratt and you see 
in this book the woman that she was before that a lot more and how she was supportive of Azur when her father shut down her dreams or like how she would play with Azur and and they would both tease her father and you really see that familial relationship so it makes in retrospect it it makes her following Governor Pratt or believing Governor Pratt and then dying hit that much harder absolutely we also see Azur sort of come to terms with her expanding relationship with Elijah expanding is a weird way to put it I hesitate to say developing because we don't actually see the relationship develop. We just, we kind of skip ahead <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, which which I think is a an interesting choice. I mean, it works. Don't get me wrong. When we finished book one, I was expecting to see their relationship develop. And I wasn't expecting this kind of time skip where they're already engaged because they're not together at the end of, I mean. I think Elijah confesses and Azur says, oh. Yeah, <laughs> Or basically. something to that effect. <laughs> basically. <laughs> and so then opening this book and having them be engaged, I go, oh. <laughs> yeah. But we get to see how supportive they are of each other. And maybe this is something I would complain about not seeing the relationship develop if their relationship was not so strongly explored in this novel, because even though, yeah, we don't see it, we don't see their their getting together process, we are still seeing them evolve and seeing their relationship evolve and, and seeing how they bring in this little girl into their kind of family unit and, and what that does. They have to have real conversations about deciding to adopt her basically at the end Mm-hmm. end of the book right it's one thing to say yes we will take care of this child while while she is in this strange <laughs> dimension but committing to that long-term relationship with a child i mean that's a big deal and so watching them sort of come to terms with their own evolving roles and then also how they rely on each other and lean on each other and have open and very like honest communication with each other was very good <laughs> yeah and and even though i mean even though azure struggles at times a little bit with whether or not she's ready for motherhood and, and how her life is changing in the, these big ways I, I really appreciate that there's not again there's there's no conflict between the two of them there's no hurdle that their relationship has to overcome they just talk about things like mature adults and it's nice it's a nice low-key thing <laughs> and like you said, it's Azur never questions if she loves Elijah and wants to be with him. Yeah, that's not the question. But she does acknowledge how scary it is to go through these life huge life milestones and changes. And I think that's just genuine human experience. Yeah. I mean, it's very relatable. Exactly. <laughs> and it avoids, you know, that hated trope of miscommunication which i cannot stand <laughs> or even not miscommunication just if there was a contrived breakup just so they could get back together so it could yeah feel triumphant at the end that would have sucked <laughs> yeah that would have that would have been horrible i would have hated that i mean the most conflict there is between them is that elijah wants to wait for marriage to sleep with her and azur is super horny <laughs> <laughs> well they, they also have a little bit of conflict where like elijah sometimes wants to take a more active role in some of like the heist for example and azur's like actually you should probably stay with oriana and watch her because a she needs someone to watch over her and b you're still kind of suffering from self-esteem i don't know if you could handle this yet and bad at lying <laughs> and bad at lying but they they talk over it and it like it's a non-issue ultimately and he stays with oriana yeah i wouldn't even call that a conflict that's just a disagreement <laughs> that... yeah <laughs> <laughs> because they don't let it get to the point of a conflict yes it, it does not get that far yeah she says hey let's do this and he says what about this and she says well this was my thought process and he says yeah you're right <laughs> like <laughs> oh my god <laughs> the best <laughs> yeah it's it's so low stakes i love it i mean not low stakes but it's so chill 
It's very chill. This book is so chill. Even when there is a volcano, <laughs> an active volcano during a sword fight for her life. <laughs> I'm not scared or worried or stressed out at all. <laughs> I mean, I was a little at that point, I was a little stressed out because I was like, oh, this these are these are some high stakes. And what if things go wrong? But I was pretty sure that, you know, things were not going to go wrong ultimately in the end because this is <laughs> not grimdark no i trusted Lockhaven to not do that to us yes i did too and he came through indeed we haven't talked about zoth avarex at all which is a disservice to him and dragons everywhere i was just gonna say yeah i i really one of the things that i've really loved in this series is seeing his character growth from the Conjuring of Zoth Avrex, which you don't have to read at all to understand these two books. But it's really nice to compare where he starts out with where he is now. And yeah, like he's he's coming to appreciate the power of love and friendship. The Conjuring of Zoth Avarex is his first appearance, but I would argue his character doesn't change much from that through Zoth Avarex's escape plan, which is a choose your own adventure short story novella short story and then into the beginning of the marauders the daughter and the dragon like i think he's still the same dragon at that point oh right but that's that's what i'm saying like that's the starting point yeah, like, yeah. when you when you start at, at the marauders the daughter and dragon the zoth avarex hasn't changed from the beginning of the conjuring of zoth avarex until now yeah. and then as you go through that book and then this book you really do see that character arc and that character growth. And knowing how he is, even though you can still appreciate that growth, if all you know of Zoth Avrex is what you see in the beginning of The Marauders, The Daughter and the Dragon, it hits a little harder if you know that he didn't change <laughs> at all, basically, in The Conjuring of Zoth Avrex. I mean, he's the villain. Yeah. <laughs> like, talk about a redemption arc. Yeah. <laughs> And actually something else that I really appreciate about this book and the first book is the way that the reference to his other stories is so subtle. Because one of our complaints about The Conjuring of South Avrex was that sometimes some of the references to other dimensions and other worlds could be a little heavy handed at times. And that's something that Lockhaven has really, really gotten good at, I think, at making those references. The, uh, reference in the karaoke scene to journey was just <laughs> chef's kiss yes yes <laughs> it's like it's that kind of thing just when the author treats it so easy breezy it makes it even more striking to you as a reader right because you're like oh wait what that's just mm -hmm. normal talking mm -hmm. about this okay <laughs> but also i really enjoyed how like you don't know why Zoth Avrex is so scared when he hears that Oriana's from Earth and, and when he hears that there's this gargoyle. Obviously, you can kind of intuit, like, you know, gargoyle is bad news for Zoth Avrex because he's acting like it's bad news. But if you've read Zoth Avrex's escape plan, you know exactly who the gargoyle is working for. And I thought that was pretty cool, too. Yeah. And he does admit at the end that he had been held captive as a pet by someone for a very long time that he had escaped and is now hiding out from and if that was all you got that'd be fine yeah you don't need more context i almost feel like going back and reading zoth avarex's escape plan after you read the azure archipelago would be very fun for a reader to sort of discover his origin i agree it would be really interesting to see actually how that because that's a choose your own adventure book it would be really interesting to see how that hits after reading this trilogy. Well, maybe. It's a yeah, it is a trilogy, right? I believe it's going to be a trilogy. I mean, there's definitely there's definitely another book after that cliffhanger. There had fucking better be. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know we just said Lockhaven would never do that to us, but oh, he did it to us. <laughs> I mean, that cliffhanger, I have rarely had a book that 
ends on a scene that literally makes me shout what <laughs> it's it's like it's like that doctor who david tennant gif where he's just going what what <laughs> like that was that was me reading that final scene i flipped back because i was reading this as an ebook and i was like oh i must have skipped a page <laughs> It's the rare double spoiler tag. Seriously, two and a half minutes. Just give a little skip if you haven't finished the book yet. This is why when we were reading it for his beta read, I was like, that cliffhanger, I can't talk about it, but that cliffhanger. Thank you for not talking about it. Oh, I could, I yeah. could never. Yeah. I could never. Yeah. Oh, the way Elijah is so, like, he clearly knew something was up. I need to know. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I, I want to know, like, what does it have to do with, Zoth, uh, does it have anything to do with Zoth Avarex being shot and, like, uh, maybe coming to the point of death? Oh, Zoth Avarex can't be dead. Zoth, no, I really hope that Zoth Avarex is not dead. There's no way. Like, in my heart of hearts. There's no way. In my heart of hearts, I don't think he's dead. But, like, the timing is suspicious. I, so, Elijah was originally under a curse from the gold on that island because he had taken gold from that island and it was e broken am i getting this confused with pirates of the caribbean was the curse broken by shedding blood of some kind no all right so that was pirates of the caribbean <laughs> <laughs> the, the curse was broken by finding all of the pieces of gold and then doing something with it it was either throwing it into the ocean or or giving it back to the island or something uh, it's got to have been returning it to the island oh oh no duh that means captain roberts probably stole something oh you're right you're right because the timing really doesn't actually when i think about it the timing for it to be related to zoth Avarex doesn't work out because zoth Avarex got shot right after they're leaving the volcano whatever that island was and they don't get married until like two weeks later Mm, that's true yeah so i bet you're right that it is captain roberts who has taken something from the island while zoth Avrix is incapacitated because he's been shot with a you know this big crossbow bolt siege weapon but ending on that cliffhanger like that is an excellent excellent i hated it i hated every minute of it <laughs> but it's an excellent cliffhanger oh my god yeah no it holy shit Poor Azor. <laughs> Poor Azor. <laughs> she waited so long. <laughs> so I know that words are weird. Obviously, everyone knows that. And made up words, silly words, are so much fun and an absolute delight. And completely the kind of silliness I expected from Lockhaven, especially when we're getting, you know, some fun little made up adorable fantasy creatures. Except apparently tiddly is a real word. Yes. <laughs> Since when? I mean, you'd have to look up the etymology to get, to get a date there. Oh, it's British. That's not a real word. <laughs> I mean, a word like tiddly, did you think it could be anything but British? I don't know. <laughs> like, they have a word that's todger for your penis. Of course tiddly is going to be one of their words. But it's not a dirty word. No, tiddly is not a dirty word. I don't know how dirty todger is either, to be fair. Any word referring to genitals is dirty on some level. Tiddly was first recorded in 1885 to 1890. Origin uncertain. A tiddlywink is any of the discs used in the game Tiddlywinks. <laughs> That's unhelpful. I thought a tiddlywink had something to do with sleeping. Tiddlywinks is a game played on a flat surface in which players attempt to snap small plastic discs into a cup by pressing the edges of the discs with larger ones. It's from 1835 to 1845, but it does not say... In particular. Oh, it is also British. Tiddlywinks derives from British rhyming slang for an unlicensed public house or a small inn only licensed to sell beer and cider. Oh, so they are, I mean, not entirely unrelated then. If tiddlywinks is a word having something to do with a bar and tiddly meaning to be slightly drunk. 
the Wikipedia says tiddly was slang for an alcoholic drink. So, hmm. well, the adorable tiddly dragons make people feel drunk and woozy with their stunning attack that they use to hunt <laughs> bees. And these are the cutest fucking things in the world. <laughs> they are they are pretty adorable. And oh, Google keeps trying to correct me because it's pretty sure I'm looking for titty. <laughs> No, Google, you're just being British. <laughs> Come disagree with us. We are on everywhere. And Twitter and Instagram, at FictionFansPod. You can also email us at FictionFansPod at gmail.com. If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts, because I think you can probably rate and review on more than just those two. Uh, and also follow us wherever your podcasts live. We also have a Patreon where you can support us and find our show notes sometimes and some other nonsense also sometimes. We should put our show notes on there and start putting our show notes on there again. You are welcome to do so. <laughs> yeah, but that's your job. <laughs> yes, I should. <laughs> anyway, thanks again for listening and may your villains always be defeated. Bye. Bye.